The next presenter is uh, Associate Professor Zoe McQuilton. Zoe is uh, another of the members from the ASCOT trial team where she leads two of the uh, domain specific working groups, both the, the antibody as well as the anticoagulation groups. She's a, a consultant haematologist at Monash Health and uh, is a wonderful person to talk to us about antibody therapy for COVID-19. Zoe, thanks for joining us and we look forward to your presentation. Zoe, you just need to unmute yourself. Sorry, <laughs> I think we would have learnt that by now after a year of Zoom meetings. Um, so I just want to say thank you for the invitation to present tonight. It's a fantastic meeting and I'm really pleased to be part of it. Um, uh, Jason asked me to give an overview of uh, antibody therapy for, uh, or the evidence for antibody therapy for COVID-19, which I'll try to give a brief overview for tonight. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly go over the current evidence for the use of convalescent plasma, which is clinical plasma collected from donors who have recovered from a SARS-CoV-2 infection, hyperimmune globulin, which is a fractionated uh, concentrated uh, antibody preparation made from large volumes of convalescent plasma, and also some of the recent uh, trials that have been reported on the use of monoclonal antibodies. Just in terms of con I don't, conflicts of interest, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest. Uh, just to note that I'm in an investigator, as uh, Jason mentioned, on ASCOT uh, with evaluating convalescent plasma, as well as remap cap, and we received funding from the MRFF. So first, um, we'll discuss convalescent plasma, and uh, I've listed this first because it was the first antibody therapy that was evaluated for COVID-19, and that's because it's a therapy that becomes available relatively early uh, within a pandemic, um, as you only need uh, enough donors who have recovered from the infection to be able to collect the product, and it has a very well-characterised uh, safety profile. And the first um, case series of uh, patients who received convalescent plasma was published in JAMA, uh, a case series of five critically ill patients from Wuhan uh, back in March last year. Uh, so since then, uh, there have been over 100 uh, clinical trials registered of convalescent plasma and or hyperimmune globulin for COVID-19, uh, and most blood services internationally commenced a program to collect a convalescent plasma. I guess there are a few things to consider in establishing these studies and also interpreting the results. The first is the study design, and as we heard in the last uh, talk, there was a lot of the, uh, you know, discussions about the best way of uh, providing access uh, to this as a, as a therapy, um, as well as providing evidence. So uh, obviously a randomized control trial is the highest uh, level of evidence for a, a therapy, but there was a large um, emergency access uh, program that was uh, implemented for co co convalescent plasma in the US uh, where thousands of patients received therapy uh, with some data collected, which pr can provide some information on safety outcomes, but less information on efficacy. There are also considerations around the selection of uh, the blood donors for providing convalescent plasma, including whether to apply the usual uh, donor selection criteria for clinical plasma, whether there needed to be any um, criteria based on the, the severity of infection that the donors had experienced, and whether they'd be better uh, donors for convalescent plasma, and also remembering that we have to look after our, uh, our donors as well and monitoring potential adverse effect events from providing this as, a, as an intervention. In terms of convalescent plasma, it's, you know, unlike a, a pharmaceutical agent, it has inherent biological variability. So how to provide this as a standardised product, the best method for collection, you know, whether apheresis or whole blood, and the dose and timing to use. And then importantly, uh, whether there should be a requirement for testing the content of the plasma, particularly neutralising antibodies prior to using it within a trial. And that very much depends on the availability of uh, and timeliness of assays. In terms of the comparison, whether it should be an open label study compared to standard of care or a blinded uh, trial, uh, and if a blinded trial, what do you use as your placebo? Saline is uh, one option, but that does produce uh, some logistical challenges and how to properly blind a, a saline bag compared to a plasma bag and ensure the safety of the product checking at the bedside. Another option is clinical plasma, but that does um, raise some ethical issues around uh, transfusing uh, your control group with a, a blood product that you don't uh, anticipate it's going to provide any benefit but does have a small but real risk of a, a transfusion reaction. 
And finally, which pa patients are most likely to benefit from this therapy in terms of uh, the disease uh, ranging from you know, exposed but asymptomatic, so as a prophylaxis approach, uh, or the uh, severity of the illness from mild to critically ill. Uh, as these new uh, strains have been emerging of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, whether uh, plasma collected from uh, donors who had the earlier strains would be as effective at neutralizing um, the virus from the, the emerging strains. How important is it in the patients if they've got their own endogenous neutralizing antibodies detected at baseline? And would there be particular patient populations who are more likely to benefit, particularly immunocompromised? So in terms of the evidence that we have to date, there have now been uh, eight randomized control trials that have uh, reported results. Um, many of them in, uh, have been stopped early due to difficulty in recruiting the full sample size. Uh, but overall, uh, around 160 adults have been uh, randomized with mild COVID, uh, 631 with moderate and 525 with severe. These are, are trials that have reported results, but I'll also touch upon some large studies that have recently um, closed with some interim findings in the public uh, domain as well. So this study here, the PLACID trial, was the first trial that completed uh, its uh, 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 expected um, sample size it was conducted in India and Joseph John who's one of the uh, speakers later today was an investigator on this study. Um, this uh, trial enrolled 464 patients who had moderate COVID-19 but not yet requiring uh, um, organ supports so and not critically ill and they received two units of 200 mils of convalescent plasma 24 hours apart and the primary outcome for the study was a composite measure of progression to severe disease uh, or will cause mortality at 28 days. And so for their uh, primary outcome, they reported no difference uh, between the convalescent plasma arm and the control arm. So 19% uh, either um, progressed to severe disease or died at 28 days in the intervention arm compared to 18% in the control arm. Now, when this trial was established, they didn't have access to um, neutralizing antibody uh, titers to test the donor plasma, but they did look at this in a, a subgroup analysis. Uh, and this was important because 64 of the patients in the intervention arm uh, received convalescent plasma that didn't have detectable uh, neutralizing antibodies. So when they restricted their analysis to comparing the intervention arm, uh, if, pa if patients had received uh, convalescent plasma with detectable neutralizing antibodies to the control group, they still found no difference. So 17% uh, in, the, in the intervention arm versus 18% in the control. And again, when they restricted it only to those that received a higher titer of neutralizing antibodies, they still found no a signal for benefit. In their secondary outcomes, they did report that patients who received convalescent plasma were more likely to be PCR negative at day seven, so more likely to have cleared the virus. And there was a signal for benefit in resolution of symptoms, uh, in shortness of breath and fatigue, but noting that this was an unblinded study. Uh, in November, there was this trial that was published also in hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19, but uh, excluding critically ill patients from Argentina. It enrolled 334 patients who received a median dose of 500 mils of convalescent plasma. This was a blinded study compared to a saline placebo. And the primary outcome was clinical status on an ordinal scale at, at 30 days. And they found a similar to the plus a trial, no difference in their primary outcome with that clinical status at 30 days and no difference in any of the secondary outcomes that were reported. Uh, and finally, this uh, trial was published in January, um, uh, also from Argentina. And this trial, unlike the previous two, uh, was uh, targeting uh, the use of convalescent plasma earlier in the course of disease. So it enrolled uh, elderly patients aged 75 years or older or patients aged 65 to 74 with uh, one or more comorbidity and had to have symptoms less than 48 hours so that they could administer the convalescent plasma within 72 hours. They excluded patients with severe respiratory disease and patients received one 250 mil unit of convalescent plasma. And the primary outcome was development of severe respiratory disease uh, based on a, a respiratory rate um, or oxygen saturation. And this is the only study to have um, shown a difference in their primary outcome. So there was approximately 50% uh, relative risk reduction uh, in their primary endpoint of uh, developing severe, severe respiratory disease. So this occurred in 16% of the convalescent plasma arm compared to 31% in the placebo arm. 
And they did a subgroup analysis where they looked at uh, patients who received a higher titer unit and found that the relative risk reduction uh, increased to approximately 70% in that subgroup. So um, in terms of other evidence we have for the use of convalescent plasma, as I mentioned, there has been a large uh, emergency uh, use uh, access program in the US for convalescent plasma. Uh, and this is an, an earlier um, publication to showing the uh, recruitment into this program in May in the US with 5,000 uh, patients uh, receiving uh, transfusion in May. Uh, and um, many more have received it since then. And these are investigators uh, recently reported a, an analysis they did on a subset of approximately 3,000 patients who'd received convalescent plasma within this program for whom they had information on the titer of the antibodies uh, level in the uh, convalescent plasma that was transfused, as well as um, the baseline antibodies in the, the recipients. And in their analysis, they compared the risk of death in uh, patients who received a higher titer unit compared to a lower titer unit. And they showed that there was an association between receiving a higher titer unit of convalescent plasma and a reduced risk of death, uh, even after adjusting for some potential confounders, including uh, age, uh, BMI, uh, baseline uh, antibody uh, presence, and, um, and the time period with which they were uh, treated during the pandemic. I would note that this isn't a controlled study, so there weren't uh, patients who received no convalescent plasma. And although they did adjust for some uh, potential confounders, there may have been other uh, but confounders they weren't able to adjust for that may account for this association. So it really needs to be confirmed within uh, other studies. And finally, I'll just um, mention this small case series that was published in Blood. Um, I mentioned it earlier that there may be particular subgroups who are more likely to benefit from an antibody therapy, and particularly immunosuppressed patients and uh, hematology patients who undergo uh, B-cell depleting therapy would be one a group that comes to mind. And this was a small case series of 17 patients who had profound B-cell lymphopenia, uh, who had prolonged COVID-19 symptoms and uh, persistently negative uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 serology and uh, positive viral load. And they were treated with four units of convalescent plasma. And in this uh, small case series, the authors reported clinical improvement and clearance of the virus um, in, uh, uh, in the majority of their patients. Um, however, again, noting that this is uh, not a controlled uh, study uh, and not a randomized study, it's only a small case series and needs to be um, confirmed in, in larger studies. And uh, the authors of this uh, are can, uh, going on to do that in a larger cohort and also uh, plans for a, a randomized study in this uh, patient population. As I mentioned earlier, there have now been three uh, larger trials of convalescent plasma that have recently uh, announced that they're closing uh, recruitment to convalescent plasma uh, with some public uh, statements available. The first is REMAP-CAP. Uh, which is the uh, uh, international uh, platform trial for critically ill patients um, with community acquired pneumonia, which has been adapted to include um, uh, patients with COVID-19. Convalescent plasma was included as an intervention in remap cap in July last year. Uh, and uh, they announced in uh, January that they were closing recruitment to convalescent plasma following an interim analysis of 912 severely ill patients. Uh, and based on that uh, analysis found that there was a, a very low probability that convalescent plasma decreased the primary, uh, it showed benefit for the primary outcome, which was number of days requiring ICU or, or death by day 21. Now the full analysis of this uh, data set is currently underway. Recovery uh, in January as well also closed uh, convalescent plasma as an intervention after an interim analysis of over 10,000 hospitalized patients. Uh, in their press release, they reported no difference in 28 day mortality with 18% uh, observed in the convalescent plasma arm versus 18% in the standard of care arm. And again, the full analysis of these trial results are, are underway and awaited. And finally, Concor One, which is a study from Canada, also announced that it was closing uh, recruitment to convalescent plasma in hospitalised adults after meeting their pre-specified threshold for futility after 614 uh, patients were uh, results were analysed. As I mentioned earlier, hyperimmune globulin uh, is a concentrated form of uh, antibodies which is manufactured from a large number of convalescent plasma collections and many um, uh, blood uh, manufacturers are, are producing a hyperimmune product for COVID-19, including CSL here in Australia. 
um, has a number of advantages over convalescent plasma, including a standardized concentration of neutralizing antibody. And you can see, for example, from the results of PLASA that that might be quite important. Uh, it undergoes viral inactivation, so that improves its safety profile from the point of view of transfusion transmitted infections. Smaller volumes are uh, required, and it also lacks other plasma proteins that are present in convalescent plasma, such as coagulation factors. And there are trials underway uh, evaluating a hyperimmunoglobulin both in hospitalized patients and pre hospital, and we await for those results. And finally, in the last few minutes, I'll just mention uh, some of the, the trials that have been reported on the use of monoclonal antibodies uh, for COVID-19. The first is the uh, BLAZE-1 study, which was a phase 2-3 uh, study evaluating two uh, anti-spike neutralizing antibodies, amlanivib and atesivimib. Uh, and this uh, enrolled non-hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. And there were two cohorts. Uh, uh, initially with a single um, intervention and then the combination therapy versus a placebo control. Um, and the primary outcome was reduction in viral load at day 11. And they did find that there was a reduction in, in viral load with a combination therapy, uh, but not with a single agent therapy. However, we need uh, further trials to assess whether this reduction in viral load at, at day 11 uh, translates to uh, clinical benefits. Uh, the active uh, three um, a Tyco study group also reported the use um, of bamlanivimab in uh, hospitalized patients uh, without end organ failure. So the previous uh, study was pre-hospitalized. This is with hospitalized patients randomized in the one-to-one -one ratio. The primary outcome for this trial was a sustained recovery during a 90-day period, but they had a futility assessment using a seven uh, category ordinal scale for pulmonary function at day five. And they stopped enrollment after 340 patients were randomized uh, due to a finding of futility. And finally, the Regeneron, which is a, a combination of two anti-spike neutralizing antibodies, reported interim analysis of their phase one to three trial, uh, again, uh, enrolling non-hospitalized patients, similar to the first uh, trial I mentioned from JAMA um, of monoclonal antibodies uh, with mild to moderate COVID-19. Uh, they also found a reduction in viral load. Uh, their time point was from day one to day seven. With a greater effect, they reported in patients who were serum antibody negative uh, at, at enrollment or had a high viral load at enrollment. Um, but again, uh, we really need further studies to see whether this uh, reduction in viral load uh, translates into a clinical benefit. So in summary, I'd say for antibody therapy um, for COVID-19, we need more information on the efficacy and safety of convalescent plasma, particularly from those uh, large trials that have recently completed um, recruitment um, uh, on some of the potential subgroups, including patients who are antibody negative at baseline who will receive a higher uh, dose of neutralizing antibody. Um, it may uh, be more promising for patients early in the disease course, as shown in that uh, Argentinian study or in immunocompromised patients. Uh, and the product may be important uh, and whether we use a high titer product or a hyperimmune globulin might improve our chance of finding a benefit from this therapy. We need more information on the um, uh, efficacy of monoclonal antibodies for clinical uh, outcomes. And I think what we've uh, learned from uh, the trials that have been successfully uh, undertaken so far is that international collaboration and availability of established trial platforms certainly uh, help uh, lead to more rapid and efficient generation of evidence. So I'll just uh, finish there. I'd just like to acknowledge Professor Erica Wood from Monash uh, University and Dr. Lisa Escort from NHSBT in the UK, who um, uh, co-wrote uh, uh, an article with me, which I've used some of that content uh, in this talk tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. That's a, a wonderful summary of that area.